Hi, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Richard Marcosi, and welcome to the Utah Story Show. Today on the program, a very special guest, Rocky Anderson, former mayor of Salt Lake City from 2000 to 2008. On the show, we talk about a lot of stuff. In the first part of this show, we talk about medical cannabis and how Rocky Anderson is suing the state of Utah and the state legislature over their inability to enact Proposition 2 the way we, the voters, said we wanted to have it. Um, He's suing them because they are basically putting in place a system where the distribution of medical cannabis will be in public health facilities. That has gone against any other state's way of rolling out medical cannabis. We talk all about that. We talk about the history of economics and retail warfare in downtown Salt Lake City. That was a very interesting part of our conversation and many other things. We had to run this in two parts because the conversation went really long. And so without further ado, my conversation with Rocky Anderson. All right, Rocky Anderson, thanks for coming on the program. Great to be here again, thanks. Yeah, we were just talking, um, the last time I interviewed you was about 12 years ago, and it was like your last week in office, and we were talking about the initiation of the City Creek Center, and you were fighting against the the Skybridge proposal, and you were, I, I heard this from so many small business owners, that you were a mayor that was such a champion of small business owners, that you actually went and met with them, you talked to them, you heard their concerns, and before or since, there's, there was never a mayor in their minds like you who was such a champion for the people. Was that always a major objective of yours when you, when you took office? Yes, and it's still a personal value. I still nag my friends. Don't buy books at Amazon. Go over to Weller's, go over to King's English, support our local businesses. We're going to lose them. We vote for better sense of community and preservation of these local businesses with our consuming decisions. And every time we go online and buy something we can buy at a local merchant, we're helping undermine them. And that's something I feel very strongly about. And of course, as mayor, uh, I had a pretty good podium to speak from about those things. Uh, the Skybridge kind of epitomizes that. Skybridge, uh, all, all of City Creek, including the Skybridge, was brought about because the LDS Church, when they bought that property, went to mall developers and advisors rather than those people who know how to build a downtown and build community. And so that's what we have. We have about, what, an 80-acre enclosed mall uh, with this little gerbil tunnel that connects the two so that people will park there, stay inside the mall, go back to their car and drive away. That's not how you build a downtown. It's not how you support our local businesses. So going back even further, um, when you first took office, it was 2000, and the decision to build Gateway was already made, if I, if I remember correctly. It's pretty much all in place, yeah. and and in play at the same time with all of this retail space was the Cordini administration's efforts to get what I called the sprawl mall built out. It was an outlet mall out past the airport, the parking lot of which would have been larger than the general public parking lot at our airport. Wow. It would have been all automobile dependent, 80% of the money would have gone from, it would have been taken away from existing businesses, and I killed it. Our council wanted it. I was able to get one of them disqualified because of his employment with the landowner, uh, the folks who own the land, that was the LDS Church, and then we were able to persuade one other council member uh, about the, the lack of wisdom for building a place like that, and they still had a majority, but it wasn't enough to override my veto, and they knew I was going to veto it. But, uh, yeah, you can only build so much retail space without hurting everybody else that's already there. So do you, do you, do you originally believe Gateway was a mistake? 
that you uh, took office? Well, I did, given the fact that we had just built light rail down Main Street. Main Street was hurting. We needed to do everything we could to, to build up Main Street and the streets around there. And I think we missed a huge opportunity not building like a, a, a this, this organic kind of downtown that develops over time, changes over time, it doesn't hinge on one kind of suburban mall model like yeah. City Creek and Gateway. Yeah, and and then uh, over your your left shoulder, we we reported on this from the outset of Utah Stories, and we called it Mall Wars, because rather than economic development in downtown being a unified vision for building a more organic street and having it focused on the central corridor of Main Street. It was like there were these conflicting values and conflicting development ideas that where Gateway eventually just sucked all the life out of Main Street and then the church was sort of forced to do something with the Crossroads Mall and ZCMI Center. Do you think that the church made the right move in deciding to build build City Creek, or was that was that just a, a band-aid solution that would eventually then kill off Gateway? Well, they, they did basically kill off Gateway. Uh, Gateway's like a ghost town now. Um, it, and it's also deprived those of us who like to go to an Apple store on Sunday of a place without going out to Fashion Place Mall. I mean, it's just insane to build a place like this and it all is owned by one owner that decides everybody has to be closed on Sundays. Uh, but yeah, I think I think what they did to each other, I mean, Gateway was trying to get Nordstrom down to Gateway, there was <coughs> that big fight, seems like lifetimes ago, by the way. Yeah, it does. Uh, but uh, it, it's hurt a lot of people along the way, and I think it's hurt the quality <coughs> of life for those of us that, that would, would like a thriving downtown, although downtown is more thriving. We don't have that core area that grows organically and can change over time. And uh, also, if you go down to Gateway, you see it's almost 100% out-of-state owned chains that they're competing with our local businesses that can't afford to go to a place like that. Yeah. So I think it's uh, it, but one of the features of this too that I think people don't really realize all that much until they start considering it, and that is we've lost the public sphere of a downtown. Most downtowns you go down there can be free interchange of ideas, you can hand out petitions, you can get up on the soapbox and speak, you can, there, there's all sorts of freedom. People can, women can wear halter tops if they want, there can be signs of affection between people. Now it's like we have a police state. You go into, into City Creek, you can't pass out a petition, you'll be ushered out. You can't wear certain kinds of clothes, you can't engage in certain signs of affection with people and especially among same-sex people. It's just, uh, the more you privatize and take that public sphere away and narrow the public sphere, it, it really fundamentally undermines First Amendment rights. That's, and an, ex that's that. an excellent point. And, and I really came to understand that at a profound level when we were just trying to get the magazine out in the early days of Utah Stories. It was like, all of Main Street, south of uh, Second South, where the church doesn't own the property, we could get out hundreds of copies. But as soon as we wanted to try to disseminate the free flow of information and ideas, it all stopped at the front door of City Creek Center because as a general corporate mall policy, they don't allow the dissemination of free speech of, of, a, of a pamphlet, of, a, yeah. of an opposing idea. And, you know, democracy can be a messy thing, but it's a very healthy thing that thrives in open communities where you have adequate public sphere, and we have just given away in the core of our city almost all of the public sphere. Yeah. 
and I think it's it's really to the detriment of everybody. Now you go in, I think it's a very anesthetized, sterile place. They, they, by design, they don't promote people just sitting around and watching other people. Everything is about efficiency, moving traffic, getting more and more people to see all of the stores that are there. It's about retail sales. And um, we, you don't have there what you find in so many communities around the world where like, with town squares, where people come, families and couples and the community gathering together and people talking and meeting with one another. Uh, and you see, you, you see the that. diversity of opinions and ideas on, yeah. on a real authentic street. You just it's, it's on visual display, and just socializing, it's being able to have a drink and have dinner and have music in the public sphere. And now you walk into these places, you know, it's a bunch of look-alike stores that you see anywhere else in this country, and offering up the same kind of fare, and not a very enriched community building experience. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I I thought a lot about something you said that we that we live in more of a plutocracy now. And and I as as more as I have examined politics and government, even at the local levels, you have so many people with their own special interests involved. And so many of our city councils are overrun with people who have their own special interests involved. But at the same time, you have so many people who are apathetic, who don't even know who their city council members are, who don't know the major issues or the, or the projects that are being fast-tracked. Do you see any way out of not living in such a plutocracy and having more people more involved in government? Well, first of all, I, I think that if we made the electoral system more open and fair and got the corrupting influence of money out of it, that that's the number one thing. Because the doors are closed to people that aren't well, don't either have themselves the resources or they can't go out and get what it costs to run campaigns. So you Look at this they... mayoral campaign now. Yeah. I mean, I spent a lot of money on mine too. Was, and, and I knew when I would take in money that people expected something, but I always made it clear, don't expect anything other than fair government and a, and a level playing field. And even at that, I had people, one of them was a developer, he came in with a former county council member and they thought they were going to get their way and I said, you know, you can get as mad as you want, but your contribution to me didn't buy me. It, it helped get good government and an equal playing field for everybody and I'm not here to do special favors for you. Yeah. But too often we see people that feel like they have to do that or that's what they're, they get into office and they think they have to hang on to office. And, keep these people happy and it really is corrupting. Uh, we, we need to hold people's feet to the fire, follow the money, and understand why do we see such bad policy? Why do we see, for instance, at the Utah State Legislature, this enormous giveaway to developers by moving the prison, number one, and now the inland port, basically taking control of 30% of the land in Salt Lake City, ripping Salt Lake City off of it, 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 millions and millions of dollars in incremental tax base, taking the power away from our city council, planning and zoning commission, and the mayor for land use decisions that determines what kind of a city we're going to have far into the future. And it's all going to be controlled by an unelected commission. That's just absolutely wrong. Thanks again for listening to the Utah Stories Show. My name is Rich Marcosian. This program is brought to you in part by Curry Pizza. Featured on the Food Network channel, Guy Fieri, Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. Uh, recently featured there, an amazing place. 
They're out in West Valley. You can order chicken korma pizza or butter chicken pizza. It's like all your favorite Indian dishes on pizza. Go to Curry Pizza. Check them out. The future of our city really depends on this. And environmentally, it's going to be a disaster as well. We need those decisions made by our elected officials who, if we disagree with them, we can go out and replace them in the democratic manner that our elections provide to us. But uh, it's, it's at the bottom of it, so unbelievably corrupt, and that's what we get with the one-party system, and it's what we get in some of these instances, like the initiatives, especially Proposition 2 and the undermining of Proposition 2 and replacing it with House Bill 3001 at the behest of the LDS Church. Yeah. And we have to be able to talk about these things. Yeah. It's not insulting. People shouldn't be shocked. Oh my gosh, you can't say that. No, we have to be able to talk the truth. Yeah, and we know that Marty Stevens, who's head of the governmental relations for the LDS Church, used to be the Speaker of the House of Representatives in the Utah Legislature. Well, then he was doing a Speaker of the House for the LDS Church, what he's now getting paid by the Church to do and that is to control governmental policy in alignment with what the LDS Church wants. Now, I think we should all be respectful of each other. There ought to be input from everybody, but when you get to the point where it's a fait accompli, where we know that the LDS Church is simply going to get its way, and we know that's the truth. We, we know it's the truth with alcohol laws. There, there's not a bill that will see the light of day in the Utah Legislature if it doesn't have the seal of approval of the highest ranking people in the LDS Church. The same ends up being true with medical cannabis. And is, and is that what your lawsuit is focused on concerning the implementation of medical cannabis in Utah? No, well, our, our lawsuit now has two causes of action. First, we're standing up for the right of the people to pass initiatives without them being undermined immediately by the legislature. We're the second state in the country to have added to our Constitution the people's right to initiatives and referenda. Mm -hmm. And that, was, that arose out of the direct democracy movement in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And that came about because of a general mistrust of state legislatures. Hmm. And now here we are, 2019, that, that amendment was added to our Constitution in the year 1900. Here we are far more than a century later, and we're seeing exactly from our legislature what it is that drove people toward the direct democracy movement and the inclusion of the right of initiative and referenda to state constitutions. So we're saying this right of initiative for the people to come together through this very difficult process of getting an initiative on the ballot and then a majority of people voting for it, that's included in our Constitution mm -hmm. to be meaningful, not to simply pass the initiative and have the legislature completely undercut you. And we're one of the few states that actually said that that's gonna, that would be possible to directly pass a law by the people. And we did that back in 1900, is that what you're saying? Right, well we were the second state in the country. Oh, second, and just then, the second then, state in the country. And then, then the right really took off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what happened in Arizona was they, they had the right of initiative, they passed a medical cannabis initiative. Their state legislature immediately repealed it. So the people there unlike in Utah, had the power to change the Constitution by popular vote, and they did. And they said, no longer can our legislature pass legislation that will undermine the core purposes of initiatives passed by the majority of people, and any bill that you pass that will touch upon a proposition is going to have to be passed by, I believe it's three quarters of each house of the state legislature. Wow. So they've made it very, very difficult for their legislature to interfere with initiatives. 
in this state, our legislature is so unbelievably arrogant, holds itself so far above the popular wishes of the voters, that on the first day possible after the enactment of the initiative statute that came about because of Proposition 2, the governor called a special session, legislature met in special session, and in one day, so absolutely undermined many of the core purposes of Proposition 2. Yeah. And they did it with the help of one of the organizations, Libertas, yeah. that had gotten in all this money, they collected all this money, went out and campaigned for Proposition 2, Conor Boyack especially, mm -hmm. with Libertas. They get it, the majority of people to vote for it, and then Conor Boyack, on behalf of Libertas, goes over and meets with Marty Stevens at the LDS Church and a bunch of other folks, and they come up with this just horrifically written House Bill 2001 to undermine what the people wanted to see happen mm -hmm. with Proposition 2, and they did it in, in such an utterly and legally absurd and invalid way that they actually, it's the only state in the country that's done this, they require by state statute that health departments and others on behalf of the state and county governments set up what, in the view of the federal government, is a full service felonious drug cartel. They actually mandate in House Bill 2001 that people go out and set up this DABC type state controlled structure mm -hmm. and the scheme to sell, purchase, store, transport, and distribute marijuana mm -hmm. in violation of the Federal Controlled Substances Act and in violation of the Drug-Free Workplace Act. Yeah, and the major provision that I liked so much in Proposition 2, which, you know, which the people passed, was if you didn't have close access to uh, a dispensary, you could grow six plants. Well, it's not, it, it, not even close. It had to be 100 miles or more. Oh, 100 miles. So you're a long distance. Yeah, but, but say yeah. you're in, you know, Carbon County, and, and you are, uh, you're in a county which already suffers from an opioid epidemic, and you're someone suffering of pain, and you're prescribed opioids or, or you're trying to get off of them. Why not leave that option of medical cannabis on the table, and if you're not close to a dispensary, Grow your own. It's it's a plant. It's a plant we've we've co-evolved with, like corn. And I think that's the thing that a lot of people don't understand. It's like cannabis was a domesticated crop that humans have interacted with for thousands of years. It's not like this strange weed that just one day showed up. Or like hemp, where I mean, yeah, our, our constitution when, was written in, on. <laughs> Paper made from hemp. And it's, That's right. It's just, I mean, a lot of the founders grew and sold hemp. Yeah. And somehow, but I mean, you legislators use... got this idea that, that that we should make it illegal, and it's insane. I and mean, you use this word cartel, and and I and that's a pretty strong word, but no other state in the country has anything like the central fill idea, correct? None. None. Where they're going to control absolutely the complete distribution and the input and the output and the pricing and all, everything, like, we're, like we plan on doing in the state of Utah. Like the DABC with yeah, alcohol. Yeah, exactly. Except the problem is marijuana is still illegal under federal law. Mm-hmm. And that's the distinction here a lot of people don't understand. Folks say, well, a lot of states are legalizing marijuana, and it's still illegal under federal law. That's true. States can say, we're not, as a state, going to make this illegal. That, that's totally within their power. What's not within their power under the Supremacy Clause of the United States Constitution is to compel people 
to violate federal law. And that's exactly what our legislature and the LDS Church working with them brought about with House Bill 3001. And um, how are they compelling people to break federal law? Through they're the saying the state health department, local health departments shall and then control the purchase and sell, store it. There are going to be outlets at local health departments for people to come pick up their marijuana. So they have to store it. These state actors are going to be transporting it. All of that, every single one of those acts is a federal felony under the Controlled Substances Act. And to store it on site, if you've got it in a local health department, you're in violation of the Drug-Free Workplace Act, which means that not only can you be convicted, well, there could be federal convictions under, criminal convictions under the Controlled Substances Act, but there are also civil penalties under the Drug-Free Workplace Act, and every county that engages in this kind of conduct can be, uh, can forfeit five years of all federal money coming into the county. Wow. So there are huge possible consequences, and I don't think anybody, we never heard one word from the LDS Church, from all the lawyers, from the legislators, about any of these ramifications. They just rushed it through so they could do it at special session, so they could undermine the will of the people to do all of this according to Proposition 2. One other thing they've done, you mentioned opioids a minute ago. There are very few doctors who really know much about the medical benefits of cannabis. But there are some who know it, and they know it really well. They're the ones that you want to go to if, you're, if you've got all sorts of symptoms from autoimmune disease. By the way, the legislature took autoimmune diseases out as qualifying medical condition. So you, it was there under Proposition 2. You can't get it now. And most people who suffer from autoimmune diseases are women. That shouldn't be surprising. Well, isn't that, that, wasn't isn't an that epilepsy an autoimmune disease? Well, there are, certain, there are, there are certain defined uh, illnesses that yeah. are covered. Uh, epilepsy, let's talk about that. There's the, the, one of our plaintiffs, his daughter has epilepsy, has horrible seizures, a lot of them and any one of which can be deadly. He started treating her with medical cannabis. And he found, you know, you just take the raw plant. It has THCA mm -hmm. instead of THC. THC comes primarily from processing, from heating marijuana. So you take marijuana plant, until you light it up to smoke it, you're not going to get high. There's no intoxicating effect from THCA. So he could put raw plant in a smoothie and it eliminated his daughter's seizures. Wow. And when she would have seizures, they were much less intense. It's been like a miracle drug. That's completely off the table now. And uh, now they're saying for this interim period, well, if you buy raw plant in a blister pack, it, one gram per blister pack. It doesn't come that way. You, you won't find it in the universe right now. And if any... It what, was, do you mean, what do you mean it doesn't come that way? You can't find it in blister oh, you, packs. you've never seen it before. No, it has to have state yeah. coating. Yeah, that, that just seems absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, so you know what Connor Boyack, was, Connor Boyack said with Libertas when somebody raised that complaint? He said, oh, buy, just buy a blister pack machine online. Go to Amazon. He didn't recommend going to our local merchants, by the way. He said, go to Amazon and buy a blister pack machine. This is how utterly absurd this has all got to be. So I want to get back to the opioid, the opioid issue. Doctors aren't limited by law in terms of the number of patients they can treat with opioids. With medical cannabis, House Bill 3001 limits the number of patients that any doctor can treat where he can recommend the use of cannabis. Well, you only have a few specialists in this area. 
why in the world should they be limited in terms of the number of people for whom they can recommend cannabis for the relief of their medical symptoms? There's no limit on opioids. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. But don't, I mean, just to play devil's advocate, don't, in other states, don't some doctors become the guy where you just sort of can make up an illness and get your prescription fast-tracked and it's a flat fee to basically just get the, not the prescription, the recommendation card. It sounds like you're, it sounds like you're describing that guy up in Brigham City that was doing that with, with and killing patients with opioids and, and yeah, other I mean, pain Yeah, medication. it definitely happens with all sorts yeah. of things. So, but, but, and nobody dies from cannabis. Yeah. There's not one recorded death. Yeah, but it, it's, it, of I think that they believe cannabis. this is somehow a limiting, uh, a way to limit the adverse effect of some doctors just becoming the cannabis doctor. And uh, they think that that's going to somehow um, limit the number of patients and limit the demand for it, but I, I mean it, it just doesn't it doesn't add up because then you're just going to your regular practitioner and trying to explain why you need cannabis. I love my doctor. He, I don't think he knows the first thing about medical cannabis. It wasn't part of his training. It's no. never been part of his experience in decades he's practiced. I want to go to somebody who actually knows it. Yeah. And that's another thing about the dispensaries. Now the way it's set up, given the, what the legislature did, uh, you go just pick up at a local health department whatever has been filled for you through this process, through the state central field. You just go pick it up. You don't have any expert there that can talk to you about dosing, about titrating, about the means of administration or the kind of product that might be good for what you're going through. You go in other states, these dispensaries, they're experts yeah. on this. The other thing is, you can't, under federal law, prescribe cannabis under yeah. the, the, the Controlled Substances Act. So what does our legislature do? They say, well, the doctors will need to recommend but then they also need to set dosing parameters, which is the same thing as a prescription. What's the product? What's how much? What's the means of administration? It's a prescription. Mm -hmm. And doctors don't want to lose their DEA licenses. So they say, well, we're not going to do it. So the legislature said, okay, the fallback will be the pharmacist <coughs> will set the dosing parameters. So now they're saying pharmacists are going to be practicing medicine without a license? Can you imagine if, if the doctor said, well, you need some antibiotics, but go down and talk to your pharmacist about what the dose ought to be and what kind of antibiotics you ought to be taking. Yeah. So they're not treating this as a medicine. And the professionals involved, they're both putting their DEA licenses on the line, the pharmacists and the physicians, by setting the dosing parameters. This bill was either consciously set up to fail or it was because of gross incompetence that it's going to fail. Well, it, it seems interesting. I went to a meeting about a week before the special session and it was with Libertas and the, you know, uh, the campaign director of uh, patients for medical cannabis. I'm trying to think of his name. San, DJ S uh, Sanchez or Sanch. Um, he, he had uh, Greg Curtis field all these questions. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, and they were excellent questions by the patients, just people who were suffering from pain, who obviously would see the benefit from medical cannabis instead of whatever it was they were taking. And, and all of these people were, were up in arms because their proposition two which was the bill that they had worked so hard to pass was now being written by the same organization that championed it. And, well, and this Libertas organization, that would have never gotten the momentum had Libertas and DJ Shantz and Connor Boyack gotten behind it. But the same people who were the champions of the patients 
we're now switching teams and deciding, oh no, we're going to go with the church, rewrite the bill, and back what they want, which is, like you described, a cartel. Connor Boyack was a total turncoat. He deceived everybody. He turned his back on the people that he campaigned to get to vote for Proposition 2, and he capitulated. This was not a compromise. It was a capitulation. And he said, well, he said, this is how he described it to me um, after that meeting. I was like, you were, you were the champion of the patients. You were the, ad the number one advocate for liberty in the area of, of residents being able to um, use this medicine that's been available for years. So why are you considering this a victory when you're rewriting the bill, taking out so many of the provisions that people wanted? And he said, because it's a step in the right direction. Yeah, well, <laughs> in Utah, you lock yourself into that, and it's almost impossible to change. It, the step in the right direction is Proposition 2. There might have been some tweaks to that over time to improve it, but to capitulate to these limits per physician, the Compassionate Use Board, how is every adult, 18 to 21, these are people that can go fight and die and kill in our wars. These are people who are adults under the law, can enter into contracts. If you're 18 to 21 years of age, no matter what your medical condition, you have to go before a compassionate use board comprised of people, none of which are physicians especially specialize in pain management, and you have to disclose all this confidential medical information and ask the leave of this compassionate use board, not your doctor, but this board, to see if you can get relief for the symptoms of your medical problem through the use of medical cannabis. It is absolutely shameful. <laughs> there are so many problems with this legislation. It just sounds like, like statism. It, sounds, it, it, it sounds, sounds like the worst kind of statism you can imagine. Yeah, and isn't that ironic given that, that it was Libertas that jumped in bed with them at the end to bring this about. Yeah. But we do have great advocates in truce, in uh, uh, epileptic like association like of Utah. patients are actually stepping forward more. Is that correct? That they're yeah. ep 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 or, uh, LDS patients for medical cannabis. It seems like they're now coming forward and saying, "Look, this isn't right. If, if your if your goal is ac accessibility to medicine and keeping the cost down, all of the measures in in bill uh, in the in the House bill de totally defeat those measures. Oh yeah, it's driving the costs up. What, what did I read the other day? It's going to cost to get a license to grow, to cultivate medical care. Yeah, we had a Utah it's farmer just, on the show. It's that unbelievable. It's well, well, $100,000 for a license. And this is the only farmer who was participating in this meeting who had a hundred grand and had the land, but then he realized he can't then come up with a million dollars in addition to meet the criteria of the law, which is you can't be able to see any plants from a road. You need a fence tall enough to, to make it so no kids can pass your farm and see cannabis growing. So the only option is to grow indoors. And he says he's going to try to come up with the money for a fence. I mean, you, you need like an eight foot tall fence. And if the road happens to be a little higher than your farm, if people are going to look down inside and see the, the plants, that you're, you're in violation of the law. Well, much of the expense isn't just for that infrastructure, but it's also to pay for all the regulation. Yeah. Utah government loves to regulate. Look what they do with the ABC. It is absolutely absurd. I fought against the ABC. I represented Groovy's movie theater. Oh, yeah. The ABC was threatening their license because they showed Deadpool that was being shown at theaters all over the state, all over the country, well, all over the world. It's the highest grossing R-rated movie ever. And our ABC was going to do that, exercise that kind of iron fist power against a local business. That's the way they conduct themselves. 
That's what we get with that kind of government control. And amazingly enough, Libertas jumps in bed with the LDS Church and the legislature, which just gets total on with all of this, does whatever they're told to do on these kinds of matters, and puts in place the super DBC. But since it's in violation of federal law, it's as if Utah set up our DABC during alcohol prohibition. That's exactly what they're doing now. Hmm. And the threat over everybody that's participating, I don't know why every county attorney isn't standing up and saying, no way is our county going to be participating in this program. And I don't know why every county council member and every county commissioner isn't joining with us as a plaintiff to say, we want the courts to determine, is what the legislature is telling us to do legal, since it is preempted by federal law? So, as you, as you fight this case, and, and you get this case in front of a, a judge, will it, be, will it be a local judge who determines if this, if this violates the law, or will it be, it's not going to be a federal judge, well, obviously it's, it's going to be a local judge. Well, you say obviously. We filed in state court. The Attorney General's office removed the case to federal court because there was this involvement of the, the supremacy clause of the United States Constitution. And then they follow up with a motion to dismiss the case on the ground that there isn't standing in federal court. So they want to have it both ways. And other courts that have dealt with this exact situation have said that. Well, the plaintiffs. They're trying, their defendants are trying to have it both ways. They remove the case to federal court, and then they argue out of the other side of their mouths that the case that the federal court doesn't have subject matter jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what the Utah Attorney General's office has done now. So now we're in this battle as to whether um, the case is going to be remanded back to state court. It absolutely has to be remanded. All all of the cases say if the defendants are arguing that the court doesn't have subject matter jurisdiction, then they haven't carried their burden to show that the case could have initially been filed in federal court, and you have to be able to show that to remove the case from state court to federal court. I, I hope that's understandable, try to make it simple, but it's just amazing to me that the, our state attorney general, the attorney general's office has on the one hand taken all the time and resources to remove this case from state to federal court and then almost immediately said the federal court doesn't have jurisdiction. This belongs in state court. There are different standing requirements in state court. That is where we're going to end up being. Uh, and, but I still put out the call to any county commissioner, any county council member, any county mayor, just for standing purposes, it would help a lot for one of them to come in and say, I have a concern. What the state legislature's told our county to do is a felony under federal law. It could result in the forfeiture of all federal money coming into our county. And I join in asking the courts to determine, was this legal for the Utah legislature to do? And I can tell you, without any hesitancy, without any question, what our state legislature did was absolutely illegal. It was invalid, and it's preempted by federal law. And so the way people could get involved, I guess, is to write their county commissioner or their county council members and tell them they should stand up for you know, the rule of law. I'd say show up on their doorstep, show up at public meetings, mm -hmm. call upon them, ask them, why are you not stepping forward and doing this? And also go into the county attorney. We have one county attorney who advised a city council member that she couldn't join our lawsuit as a plaintiff if it was mentioned in the lawsuit that she's a city council member. That is absolutely absurd. There's no basis for it. She's got all the freedom in the world to decide to join. In fact, it's her First Amendment right to decide to join 
in our lawsuit and stand up for her county, even if the, her, the county council as a whole isn't going to do it. Yeah. But I don't understand why county councils or county well, commissions aren't voting. I think you'd be able to get like Moab or uh, Summit County. I mean, Summit or County, Grand county or Summit County. Yeah. yeah. And I'll tell you that, I mean, up in Davis County, you ask the county attorney up there what he thinks. He's yeah. going to say it's preempted. It's invalid. So the, so your contention, if I, if I can understand this correctly, is using state health departments for the distribution of medical cannabis violates federal law and could end up costing them five years of federal funding because they are violating the DEA, DEA laws, is that correct? It, yes, but it, it, it goes beyond using them. The, the law passed by our legislature mandates. And so is no this. other state using state uh, health facilities to distribute medical cannabis? No. This is, a, this is no. unprecedented. No other states. state requires okay. people to engage in the distribution. Actually, in, in Colorado, as part of their medical cannabis law, and it became part of their constitution, there was a requirement that if somebody was arrested on a drug offense and acquitted, that the police would return their cannabis to them. Hmm. And there was a challenge to that, and the court said, yes, that does constitute the distribution of marijuana and the federal law prohibiting that preempts the state law requirement. So that part of the Colorado Constitution is invalid under the federal Constitution. But, but I mean, de don't DEA laws also preempt all of the laws of being able to no. grow it in, United, in, in Utah? No. Nope. They don't preempt it? No, because all the state laws that when we talk about legalizing marijuana, mm -hmm. they're just saying the state won't come after you for doing it. Okay. And the growers are confident enough, and the sellers, that the federal government isn't going to come after them because at this point Congress has uh, cut off any funding from the Department of Justice to go after people for selling, buying, distributing cannabis in states that have legalized it. Mm -hmm. There's no more DEA funding for that. There's no funding now for okay. that. But, you know, President Obama promised when he first ran for president that there would be no enforcement. He's not going to use any federal resources to go after people where medical marijuana was legalized. Mm -hmm. Then after he was elected, he kept on Bush's head of the DEA. They prosecuted people with a vengeance for medical marijuana in those states. It was a total betrayal. Yeah. It earned him a, a cover article for Obama's betrayals mm -hmm. regarding medical marijuana. Then his second term, or maybe it was probably at the end of his campaign for his second term, he once again promised, okay, we're not going to do that anymore. And they didn't. Then comes Trump, mm -hmm. and he appoints Sessions as his attorney general. He says, I'll leave it up to the attorney general. Sessions comes out. We're he's totally anti-marijuana. We're coming after you. It's illegal under federal law. So it changes all the time. It goes back and forth. It's such a strange environment we live yeah. in legally. So I it's hope eventually Congress will do the right thing in terms of descheduling uh, marijuana. Mm -hmm. But until they do, it's a federal offense. And any law, it doesn't matter what the likelihood of enforcement is, the state law cannot require people to violate federal law. That's, so that's what the supremacy that's what it, clause that's what it all comes down and to. And that's what's unique about Utah's laws. Okay. Well, interesting. And and um, we'll take a little break, and when we get back, we'll be, we'll be talking about more related to federal law and things like that. Okay. Thanks for watching the Utah Stories show. My name is Richard Marcosian. I'm the editor and publisher of Utah Stories magazine. If you'd like to support the program, as I said earlier, you can become a member. Or if you'd like to just help us spread the word, share this podcast with a friend. Whether you do it on iTunes or YouTube or your favorite podcast listening platform, that would really help us get the word out. 
And uh, also, if you are on YouTube, we love to hear your comments. So comment below or visit us on our YouTube channel on utahstories.com. We'd like to hear what you like about this podcast, in particular, what you'd like to see more of, what you uh, find interesting about physics, technology, perhaps the lunar landing, if you believe it happened or if you believe it was a hoax, I, we'd like to hear from you. So leave a comment below and we'd appreciate that. Or leave us a five-star review if you're, if you're listening on iTunes. And until next time, this has been Rich Marcosian with help from Drew Pecon, Connie Lewis, and Louie Lewis. Thanks, thanks for all the help from all the people who helped put this podcast on. Until next time, I'll see you, see you with our next guest. Bye.